Hi, I'm Nilesh, and I want to talk to you today about how we built a metadata ecosystem using the Hive Metastore at StitchFix. A little bit about myself. I'm a software engineer in the StitchFix's data platform team, where I currently work with things like Apache Spark, Apache Hive, and solving data problems for data scientists. I used to work at Cloudera, where I worked on Spark and MapReduce. And I'm a contributor to the Apache Software Foundation for a few projects for a long time. So here's what I want to talk to you about today, just give you an overview of what Stitch Fix is, talk to you about metadata, particularly how we see it and what it's useful to us, the Hive Meta Store, where we began and how we started off with understanding the problem of metadata, and then talking about building a metadata ecosystem around it, and then finally leaving you off with some of the learnings we had and the future work that's planned in this area. So what is Stitch Fix? Uh, what does the company do? It is a personalized styling service. Uh, we have two avenues of the business. Uh, you create your style profile, essentially tell, tell us what your style is. And on the top, you can either get five handpick items sent to you, and you can keep what you like and send back the rest. Or, or versus you can have a personalized uh, curated store where you can check out whatever you like. Data science has been the backbone of what we do behind the scenes. And so I'm part of the algorithms organization, which has about 145 plus data scientists and platform engineers. These data scientists are mainly split into three verticals, merch, client, and styling. And the data platform sits horizontal to these organizations. And um, this, is, this is embodied in the algorithms tour. So feel free to check out when you get a chance to, to understand how data science is used behind the scenes. Jumping to the topic and giving you a bit more introduction, I want to talk about metadata and what it means to us and um, start off there about the conversation about building an ecosystem. So what does it look like? Essentially, bare bones definition would be data about your data and stored as a high level entity that can be consumed. But in our case, it's Hive tables. Do we use that via the Hive meta store to store structured data? And what metadata holds for us is things like structure, schema, columns, data types, and location, where in the underlying, where is the underlying data located within the data warehouse, and any additional contextual information about the entity uh, that you might add. So how do data scientists actually interact with metadata? They, they have two avenues to do that. One is the REST server directly with the REST layer consuming metadata looking at tables or interacting with what, whatever metadata is available, or inter indirectly uh, using it via engines. So let's say you want to read a table, write into a table via Spark or Presto. So why is this important to us as, a, as an, a team and an organization and a company? We, we can read and write data and add metadata to it. It gives meaning. And the path to creating metadata essentially is sort of singular. The source of truth is consistent. And that's why the whole organization has the same view of all of the metadata. And all our engines, our distributed frameworks, everything else uses the same meta store to read metadata each time. And we're seeing the same structure all throughout the organization. And finally, metadata is helpful to document certain entities, help in even auditing, and help source information for ETLs, like uh, understanding where data lives and how to get certain pieces of data. So jumping to the Hive Meta Store itself, like where, where we started off, and uh, I want to talk about some things that it couldn't do for us, and uh, that sort of gives you a, gives you an idea of where we're going. So we chose the Hive Meta Store. The Meta Store is the the Hive Meta Store is the portion within Hive that allows you to store and discover metadata, but we chose it for its compatibility with things like Apache Spark and Presto. It helps provide basic metadata storage and discovery, and it was easy to stand up. So we set up a standalone Hive Metastore. Currently, we're on the 2.3x version with its own MySQL database. We use RDS behind the scenes. And I want to give you an idea of where, where it's actually positioned in our infrastructure. So going left to right, this um, you'll see Spark jobs, notebooks. We have a pandas interface where data scientists used to read and write data. So all of this reads and writes data from the data warehouse, which is a combination of Amazon S3 for the actual files, and the Hive Meta Store that we talked about uh, at the center, where metadata is stored about the data stored in S3, 
Presto is used to only read. And Kafka, the event bus, is writing data into the data warehouse as well and storing it as high-level tables, hive tables that are consumable by ETLs. So where does this fall short? It's a useful tool, but uh, we found being a bit limited. And these limited limitations can be categorized as I think of them as absence of abstraction, a bit more less lack of stability, and uh, finally difficulty to sort of customize for any additional patterns than uh, non-traditional patterns and uh, the ones that we need. So talking about abstraction, we since we were only using the Metastore from Hive, we had only Thrift as an interface to use. So we definitely needed an abstraction to use the Metastore. We couldn't expect data scientists who are our customers uh, to read, create, and write all the metadata without a sort of layer of abstraction. And so we had to build something on our own rather than depend on something that was already available. With stability, larger deletions and updates were sort of concerning. And uh, some of the deletions took, um, took, took a concerning look because we, we observed database locking that happened into some of those deletions. We, um, we observed polling and repeated reads for certain objects in the Metastore, and so that was also a concern. And some read calls were observably more faster if they go directly to the database. And so we observed that the thrift layer itself was a bit slower and less stable for some of these larger method calls. And finally, the third uh, limitation, the support for custom patterns. We had specific business cases that couldn't be directly solved by the Metastore. I'll, I'll address them in the upcoming slides. But to give you an idea that we didn't want to address these by either forking high or patching it and changing its structure, we'd be sort of uh, hurting ourselves with a lot of the patches that we had to do. And we didn't want to create something that is specific and out of the box that might be breaking compatibility with Spark or Presto eventually. But despite this, but these limitations didn't stop us from using the Metastore. We thought, let's just build something around it to address these limitations. Uh, since the Metastore is more Hive and B-like, we ended up naming most of our services somewhat be like and more appear in, uh, in nature. So coming to the actual building of the, the metadata ecosystem, I want to give you an overview of what it is. And I'll take you to each part and talk about why we built each of them. So this is how it stands today. This is how it looks going from left to right. You have the user facing layer where clients uh, are used by data scientists. And those go into the back end layer, be it Bumblebee, and I'll talk about each of those red, uh, red marked boxes because those are the those are the key elements. Uh, we have Spark EMR, we have Presto clusters, and these go into what Meta Metastore proxy. And then finally, towards the extreme right, you see the uh, standalone Hive Metastore that I spoke about, and it, there's a Kafka topic emitting events from there. And I'll talk about each of these things, but I wanted to give you an overview at the beginning. So let's look at how we tackled specifically abstraction and stability. So data scientists needed more expressiveness with metadata, like actual CRUD operations, like create, read, any kind of update, delete for metadata. And how do we do that? So that was sort of a question mark in our ecosystem at the beginning since the Metastore stood alone and uh, it didn't have sort of this abstraction layer. And so what we needed was a layer that wraps the class structure of Hive table, like table database partitions, the basic metadata objects, and Essentially, we needed a readily accessible API and a Python client. So Python is a, the default language for our data scientist teams. And uh, this wanted to we wanted to allow them more expressiveness with metadata. And especially one other thing was making metadata available as a first class field. So the Hive table would have a sort of generic metadata field to add additional data that would uh, come from data scientists specifically for their needs. With regards to stability, uh, we noticed that the Hive Metastore couldn't handle all the requests. Like We couldn't bombard it directly with all the department's needs. Yes, it's the source of truth, but we needed some sort of layering before it. We had to handle requests from Spark, Presto, dashboards, and things like that. So we needed sort of this layer to handle some of those requests. A caching mechanism was sought for, uh, thought to be the easier solution to relieve some of those repeated calls. And for some method calls, they were observably larger, and we needed to bypass Thrift to go directly to the database. So enter Bumblebee. Uh, like you see the B naming that's coming here. Um, it's a REST server with its Python client. 
And what we did was, first of all, abstracted the Hive classes. And to make it more convenient for usage, we returned Python dictionaries to represent them. So each of the table, database, partition would all be represented as Python dictionaries. And like I said, metadata was importantly needed to be a structure within the Hive table. And so that, again, became a Python dictionary within a table for any auxiliary information that you might need to add. With respect to stability, like I mentioned, some of those calls were things like get partitions, get all tables, which were more heavier. And it made sense to, to revert them into making it read for MySQL. And so that was done for those particular calls, especially. And finally, Bumblebee added a tiny cache that allowed quicker loads of table objects that were frequently accessed. So some of the production tables were heavy hit. And so uh, this cache sort of relieved that pressure uh, of reading a, a repeated object. So the um, this is how it looks. The Bumblebee server essentially talks to the Metastore directly. And it makes separate calls to the MySQL database for some operations, like I mentioned. And to the bottom, the Bumblebee client had the ability to do CRUD operations on Hive artifacts, set metadata. And I'll talk about the ownership bit in a bit, but uh, it allowed data scientists to do that as well by interacting with the server. So in a Python job, this was how would you, you would use Bumblebee. Uh, you would import the client and try to get an object. And that's what's returned to you as a Python dictionary, like I mentioned. So to access each of this information, you would just do a key search on the, the object return. And you would get returned the, um, the, need, uh, the object that you need, like metadata, column, or name itself. So we have empowered the data scientists with metadata. But uh, like Uncle Ben and Spider-Man said, with great metadata comes great responsibilities. And so it, uh, it made sense to sort of keep these things in, uh, in balance. And so we had to think a little bit more beyond just expressiveness. So we started off with the idea of ownership and making sure that data scientists own each artifact that they create. And so the Mumblebee client was sort of augmented to set these ownerships on Hive tables. And data scientists had to declare this ownership while they create and to indicate ownership of a table. But we needed to create, maintain a clean metadata ecosystem and not just like having own tables, but sort of an accountability of why tables existed. So clearly, ownership wasn't enough. We, had, we needed to have more context and more purposeful metadata. So we asked ourselves questions like, why this table exists? Can we declare its purpose? What is it, what is it used for? What code writes to this table? Can we clean this table up if it's not referenced or not used? And finally, we, we came up with these questions as a as sort of a workflow to add additional metadata to Hive tables so that we, we come to a point where we know why a table exists in, in the Metastore. And it's not just there for, uh, for no reason. And so this workflow is really helpful to address that. And this is how it looks like. You create a Hive table. A metadata service would notify the um, table owner. And they go, around, they go with two rounds of metadata update. So in the first round, uh, the owner would essentially link the table code, add comments, check schema, or any kind of uh, sort of auditing work of the, of the table itself, and pass it on to another team member to confirm it and to just sort of a, uh, have a second look at uh, whatever the metadata is included. And then they could either reject it or notify it and say, hey, you could change something, or they could confirm it. And then finally, the metadata itself is updated on the table. And so now we have this complete picture of why this table exists. So this is where increased metadata uh, fit in. Like the metadata object I mentioned in a Hive table is where all these pieces fit together. So when it was confirmed, let's say the review date and the table code and the owner so there's sort of this accountability of uh, why this table exists. And surprise, surprise, it's a table that stores data about clothes for an apparel company. But that's, um, that's how we sort of gave this notion of uh, why uh, giving a purpose for a table with like things like comments, as simple as that. And so we built a service around this increased metadata that we already have now uh, to allow us to check if the table is being referenced, if there's jobs connected to it, if it's been right, written to. And that's more complicated behind the scenes, but the idea is that uh, it helped us clean up a lot of those unused tables. So now we talk about 
Uh, the third uh, and final limitation that we observed, uh, essentially building custom patterns and support for them in our ecosystem. So solving these, um, these are not traditional ones. We observed these as we went and grew as a business. And so I wanna talk about what, what these two patterns were. They're sort of limited, uh, the related with the solutions that we came up with. And so I sort of clubbed them together in terms of the, the need and the, the sort of piece of the infrastructure it generated. Uh, the first one is essentially test data. Test data was coming in with regular data and was stored in the data warehouse. So think of like sample client or any kind of testing you do with um, any kind of table and that passed on into a production table. But we didn't want this test data to essentially create poor training for our algorithms. So we needed a way that this test data would be isolated from within a hive table. So if you read a table, not, you would not necessarily get, you shouldn't necessarily get something with the test data. And so we had to isolate that in a way that it was not hurting some of the algorithms. And on the second one, we observed, and this was a pattern for growing up for a while that data scientists would create table views, essentially tables that were mere pointers, pointers to a table's partition. So let's say a historical table has been storing data every day, partitioned by date. So a table view is something like a table that just points to whatever the latest partition of that table is. And so these tables became abundant and the, the cumbersome part was to actually having to update these tables each time a new partition was created. So if the historical table broke data for yesterday, you would be updating uh, your view table to act accordingly and point to the new partition. And so it's sort of this extra piece of workflow that was uh, becoming cumbersome and unnecessary. So how do we solve this? We couldn't essentially modify Bumblebee. It was, it was something that needed to come from the Metastore. It would take a lot more work if we went through the Hive route and patching the binaries. And we sort of needed, uh, in our thinking, that we needed something like a Metastore, an interface that was both compatible, which was important in Spark and Presto, but it was sort of malleable and changeable in our way that it functions according to our needs. And so we thought of this sort of indirect, indirect layer that worked behind the scenes, and we sort of thought of it, thought of it as a proxy metastore. And I'll explain it about a bit. So entered Yellow Jacket, um, a bit of a superior insect, if you will. But um, we started off with to experiment with basic thrift code uh, to see if we can route traffic uh, from the metastore and uh, act as an intermediary between uh, our backend and our Metastore. And so every service now thought of this proxy as the Metastore. So to begin with, we wanted to just check if the methods were working. And so we che checked this with both Spark and Presto, and they were both fine since we supported the method methods available. So we called it Yellow Jacket, a thrift server that essentially proxies the load balancer of the Hive Metastore and uses its da database for internal queries. And what it did was it supported all the queries uh, that are available in all the methods, sorry, in the in the high Metastore thrift layer. So anything requests coming from Spark or Presto or Bumblebee or any, any other metadata service you would have, it would get resolved because it's essentially the similar layer like the, um, like the Metastore itself. So now given this flexibility of having these method calls right in front of us, we could overload these methods to adjust to our needs and be suitable to some of these patterns. So this is where it fit, right at the center yellow jacket. Uh, you can see this is the backend layer coming from that earlier diagram I showed you with uh, the Bumblebee server, the EMR cluster, uh, the Presto cluster, all pointing to yellow jacket as if it were the Metastore. But yellow jacket would talk to the standalone Metastore for all its calls. And it would call the DB for certain uh, aspects of the test data and the view solution. And I'll talk about that in a bit. And so this ended up becoming sort of the meta store where every service would hit and the standalone meta, uh, standalone meta store would be left alone. What it helped here is uh, in addition, we could upgrade things like the meta store. We came from one to one, one to two to two, three X fairly recently. And so yellow, uh, yellow jacket was uh, key in that upgrade process as well. So isolating um, test data is the first solution that we uh, tackled. Uh, let's say we made this part of the workflow that if a high table was expecting 
or had expected test data, the user who was creating the table would have to create a test data partition. So just a partition column that was sort of towards the end and specifically wrote one for the presence of test data in a record and zero for the absence of test data in a record. So uh, if a row uh, had zero in a test data column, it wouldn't have test data, it was more production. And one would be, be called classifying it as test data. And behind the scenes, what we did was uh, we hid this partition columns, this column particularly, so that we know that um, uh, we can hide test data when needed. And we did this by overloading the get table method and adding a decorator. So if the name included a sort of pattern, like, uh, like, I should, like it's listed below the double underscore include test data, the yellow jacket um, method would know that you're asking explicitly for test data and it would react the, uh, react the appropriate way. I'll give you an example to highlight this, but uh, this decorator pattern helped us um, save a lot of uh, pain while doing this sort of isolation. So let's look at the table, test table with a test data partition. Uh, so if you read this table naturally, you would get always the production data. So Yellow Jacket would just think of it as a regular table and would the indirection would just return all test data equals zero because you're not explicitly asking for it. And if you're asking for test data, you would do the decorator pattern like include test data and or explicitly set test data equals one in a SQL filter clause. And Yellow Jacket would know behind the scenes, given the name and using uh, just by the name, that it would surface the test data equals one data. So this indirection was really useful to sort of isolate test data from production data. And so anybody who doesn't even know the structure would read the table as it is, would always get production. But let's say somebody explicitly wants test data, then they can query it in this way. So the view solution was also um, something we addressed, which uh, we thought of let's just automate that and make it make it more easier for data scientists. So an example of that is let's look at test table again, which has a date partition. And I told you this would be a pattern where historical data stored date-wise would be uh, made into a pointer table. And so that was the that was the use case that we tried to solve. And so let's say you were addressing that today, yesterday's data would be latest for today morning. And so um, looking at that, instead of having a separate table to address this and represent this latest data. All we did was modify the get table to return a quote unquote view, um, which is a decorator pattern that we used for exhibiting the view of a table. So a view would be the latest numerical partition of a table um, and it would be auto-generated when required. And so you don't need to actually specify or update or do anything. This view doesn't exist in the Metastore as an entity and it would be generated via Yellow Jacket when requested. And so essentially, we would take the, uh, the historical table and present the latest partition as, um, as the table. So this indirection was really useful to solve this uh, use case. And in Spark and Presto, we did it in such a way that with the methods behind the scenes, we had to adjust a few things. And so test table, you could do test table underscore underscore view and it would read the uh, latest data available to you. And so you didn't need any updating happening. And the same goes for test data. It was uh, same on Spark and Presto as well. So you'd ask like, how do we track this ecosystem? It's a, it's a large ecosystem with things like abstraction. There's an indirection layer now and uh, metadata operations were happening everywhere. And so tracking this needed more context just by, just by not by simple logging. So to understand context, like what operation was done, maybe a name or a type, when it was done, where did it come from? Did it come from Spark or Presto or Bumblebee? Who did it? Was, was it some team or user who had performed it? And so tracking this was became a real concern. So we called it Buzzcom, a uh, cheeky name for something like, think of a telecom network within a hive. And so we observed that the Metastore itself came with its event listener and had a support for your operations that fired off events. So you would, you could produce them in a log and get an idea of which events actually happened. So, but it didn't, it didn't have an extra context that was needed in our case for understanding more about the operations. So we observed that every create add drop delete method for either table, database or partition had something equivalent of a uh, method with an environment context. It's literally called that. And so, 
we noticed that this environment context object had a sort of uh, map structure called properties, which was sort of open-ended and we could pass any information we wanted. And so we, we decided to use those behind the scenes and we patched the ones that were missing. We, we noticed that altered database was not an event. So we added that explicitly. And we published this uh, these events to a Kafka topic, so it ends up being more consumable than just writing it into a log. And so we parsed that, we cleaned up the object, cleaned up the structure, and passed it into a topic, so it becomes consumable downstream by any syncs written on Kafka. And so we had to patch Spark and Hive in our libraries to and Bumblebee to use this, but uh, all, all in all, it ended up um, using uh, this environment context method and uh, passing additional information uh, that was useful. So finally, when you do pass this all the towards the end, you would record an event something like this. So create database would be the operation source and ID to trace it back to where it came from. So Bumblebee's ID would be stored, the operation timestamp to indicate the timing of the the operation and finally the source, uh, which is Bumblebee, and in other cases it would be Spark or something else. And there's more information in other kinds of events, but I wanted to give you an example. So things like add partition would store which keys and values were actually added, and alter table would store both the new and the old structure. So things like that. So coming coming finally to the learnings and the future work, this was. Uh, this is sort of a multi-year effort of building this ecosystem, and I wanted to share some of the learnings that came along the way for us and the future work that's planned. So what did we learn here? The uh, getting essentially the main purpose of getting these things were useful for our business, but compatibility with Spark and Presto were essential, and so a lot of testing was done while rolling these out. With Bumblebee's inter introduction, it meant a lot of documentation, a lot of helping data scientists to migrate to use this new interface to manage metadata. So that was, we observed a lot of pull requests everywhere. And so um, that, was a, that was a big change in the team. And so migration of code was, uh, took a lot, of, uh, a lot of effort. With Yellowjacket, it seemed more behind the scenes, but um, specifically challenging for us to uh, implement because we noticed that Spark and Presto interacted differently with the Metastore. So I'll give you an example, like get partitions is called different methods by, uh, different methods are called whether you're coming from Spark or whether they're coming from Presto. So some of those need to be needed to be adjusted. And so testing that was also uh, quite challenging. And finally, we wouldn't be anywhere without alarms and alerts, but uh, they saved us from disasters and they still continue to do so. And so uh, that's something we've always learned and kept behind the uh, at the back of our heads to make sure that we set up these things more accurately. And finally, looking ahead uh, in this effort with dedicated logging now in place with Buzzcom, we have eventually a plan to sort of trigger workflows based on uh, metadata changes or any kind of availability of data. And so that's something that's being worked on. A recovery mechanism for Hive is being worked on as well, where disaster strikes if something goes wrong, using some of this logging that we have now so that we can replay some of the events to, to understand that we, uh, what happened at the time of, let's say, a crash. And I, I gave a talk at Data AI Summit about data quality, so feel free to have a look if you, if you get a chance. But uh, I want to mention that we are doing data quality powered by metadata in the tables. And so you can declare tests and set rules for tests in metadata, and we have a mechanism to read that and perform tests, and so that's been expanding as an effort within the company as well. So that's uh, that's something that metadata has proven to be useful for uh, as well. To summarize, um, metadata has been important for us at Stitch Fix. We began with the Metastore, but we understood some of the limitations that made us expand it into a more full-fledged ecosystem to improve abstraction, uh, the first one of the limitations, we built a REST server and a client that allowed data scientists to be more control of the metadata and give them more expressiveness. We added caching, additional optimizations um, to help keep the Metastore more stable, uh, especially for larger calls or repeated calls specifically. And finally, we added a proxy Metastore that allowed us the ability to provide indirection and support for some business logic that was not uh, while maintaining sort of compatibility with Spark and Presto and solving the problems that we had. So that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, happy to take any questions.